All right, good afternoon. My name is Doug Rickett. I'm a software engineer on Google Maps here in Mountain View, California. And this presentation is about new features in the API. So I'm actually going to start with some of the recent features from the last six months that you wouldn't have found if you came to GeoDeveloper Day last year or even a few months back. And then after that, we'll go into features that were released this week. And we even have some presentations on features that are not yet released yet. And that will be given by Brandon and Pamela. I want to point out first, at the bottom of the slide here, this URL is the URL for this presentation. So if you have a laptop with you now, you're welcome to follow along. Or if you go home later, you can take this URL and look at the presentation yourself. So that's doug.rickett.com slash gdd2007 slash new.html. And if you don't get that now, you can ask me at the end of the presentation, and I'll have it for you. All right, the first feature I want to talk about is Marker Manager. And this feature is actually something I've had some involvement with for a long time. The way I first got started on Google Maps was through a weather map gadget for the Google homepage. And one of the difficulties involved uh, in showing the weather for every city in the US is, what do you do if you zoom out to the entire US? I don't want to show 10,000 weather icons, right? I found, I, I got data for about 20,000 cities in the US. But when you zoom out, you only want to show maybe the most populated 50. It would look crazy to the user if you showed all 20,000. And if you even tried to do that, Google Maps would probably fall over. Because honestly, we can only handle a few hundred without a significant performance degradation. So part of the difficulty there is, given a viewport and given a lot of information, how can you show only what's relevant? And that's kind of where Marker Manager comes into the picture. Marker Manager is an API tool that we give you where you can provide thousands and thousands of markers, and the marker manager will take care of hiding and showing the appropriate markers as the user pans the map. So let's look at this example. If I run this code, you can see what it does. It starts with a for loop for the zoom level that starts at zoom level 10 and goes down to zoom level 2. And it's putting down 2 to the power z number of markers at a given zoom level. So that means at zoom level 10, where we're zoomed in maybe to you know, a few hundred kilometers, we have many markers. If we zoom out to the entire world, we're only putting down a few markers. And what you'll see now after I ran this code is if I zoom out, I have some markers visible over Europe right now. If I go another two levels in, you'll see more markers added to the map. And another thing you'll notice is as I pan the map, Markers are going to show up and be hidden. So it, it looks like a continuous, smooth effect, where I'm zooming around the entire map, and there are markers in France, there are markers in Germany, markers in Poland. But at any given time, there are only 20 markers shown on the screen. And that means you have very good performance as you're scrolling. You're not slowed down, even though you have many thousands of markers. Yes, question in the front. Yes, the question is, don't those markers still take up space in memory? And yes, they are in memory. However, the performance that you see is good in that case, because the memory they take up might only be, you know, even for thousands of markers, they don't take up many bytes for a single marker. Maybe, I don't know, 10, 50 bytes, 100 bytes. You know, even a half a meg of memory for thousands of markers is not going to slow down your browser. So Marker Manager is an attempt to optimize showing thousands and thousands of markers. Yes.
Yes, that's right. So it makes panning smoother. All right, the next example I want to talk about is showing XML formatted geodata in the Google Maps API. So for example, in Earth, we have the KML file format for a long time as kind of a, an emerging standard for geodata. So for example, here's a, a KML file showing the location of all of these interesting airplanes that you can see on Earth if I zoomed in on the imagery. And I can take that same KML file now, and I can display it in the API. So here's the URL for that file. And really, all that matters is this one line at the bottom, which is add overlay GeoXML. GeoXML, you can see a few lines above, was created just by giving it the URL. So here are the same airplanes. Right? And if I zoom in, I'm going to see them all over. So the idea here is we're moving towards supporting a common format for data interchange. And I mentioned uh, KML from Google Earth. We also support GeoRSS. And we're moving toward a vision where you know, geodata just flows seamlessly from one place to another. This is also a help to you if you are an API developer, because it allows you to separate code from data. And for example, in the introductory session this morning, we talked about uh, gdownload URL, which is the standard way to load a file in the Maps API. And the example I showed then, you had to parse the data yourself. So basically what we're giving you is we automatically parse KML and GeoRSS and display that on the map for you with just one line of code. Also, I should mention, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. Just wave your hand. I see a question there in the back. Yeah, the question is, right now, Google Maps doesn't support region or view-based refresh. When will that be available? Uh, I don't know a specific date, but we're always working on adding more features to that. So I would expect that work will be done on it. All right, now we're moving on to tile layer overlays, which is a way that you can create your own tiles. And if you had asked me about this a year ago, the way to do this kind of thing would have been to create a new map type. And a map type is like uh, we have the map layer, the satellite layer, and the hybrid layer that combines both. So you could create your own map type, which is one of those th three layers. Now the difference with tile layer overlay is it doesn't have to show up as a map type, as one of the three possible map type choices. And it's more dynamic. It's much easier to just add a tile layer, remove a tile layer. So for example, you could have 10 different tile layers that you turn off and on, off and on, according to checkboxes, something like that. So let me get some audience participation here and ask someone to take a wild guess. What's going on with this code that I highlighted? Uh, on the aisle, yes. It's calculating a tile. Yeah, it's calculating the tile URL, exactly. So the way our tiles work, basically you're given an X, a Y, and a Z, and you return the URL for a tile. So here, tile is actually a point with an X and a Y value, and you get zoomed separately. And we're constructing a URL here. This is a URL at Stanford. Here's the path, and we substitute the x value, the y value, and the zoom, and it's a PNG type file. So let's see what happens when I run. 
Now here at Stanford area, and you can see this is the regular Google Maps tile in the background. And we've overlaid these set of custom tiles. And you can tell they're tiles if you panned quickly, you'd see them load. Or maybe if I zoom in. Yeah, did you see the Google Maps tiles loaded underneath? And then as an overlay on top, we're showing these Stanford tiles. Can you set transparency? Yes. One thing I should mention about transparency, if you're using PNG files, you need to define this line here, is PNG, because we need some, some special processing for PNGs on Internet Explorer. Question in the back. Yes, what happens when you can't add the, the scope of the file? Does it, does it you know, have that uh, no bound uh, element to it? Yeah, good question. What happens when you pan past the scope of the tiles? So for example, here I'm looking at Stanford. Suppose I pan a couple miles to the side. I think if you look quickly, you might see a little flicker as it, it tries to load. Uh, but when it gets no tile, it's just transparent. You don't have any error message. Yes, question? I'm sorry, you said what's encoded? Yeah, the georeferencing information for the tiles themselves. The georeferencing information for the tiles themselves. So to be compatible with Google Maps, you have to use our format if you're displaying it on top of Google Maps. So for example, you can find in the documentation, we use the Mercator projection, and it's explicitly defined. Uh, I told you here you have tile.x, tile.y. You can use the Mercator projection to calculate latitude, longitude to tile x and y. Now, it's also possible you don't want to use Google Maps tiles at all. And then you can go and create your own projection and do whatever you know, system for latitude and longitude you like. People even, have even used this for completely non-geo-related things. There was an example I saw of an API site uh, that was displaying super high-resolution photos using the Google Maps API and they just cut their image into tiles. Yes, question? You can also, with some simple calculation expression in your JavaScript, compute the latitude and longitude of the bounding box of that tile and transfer it back to your server. You would be able to eliminate the compatibility problem. Yeah, thank you. Figure out your own projection. Yes, thank you. The, the comment was, you can also compute the latitude, longitude, bounding box of any given tile in JavaScript. Yes? Uh, the uh, G-Grant overlay has just not passed the Mercator. That's the next slide. Oh. <laughs> yes? If you have a self-documenting format like GeoShift, does it just project it to Mercator on the fly? Uh, if you just use Google Maps, API is exactly as I'm showing you here. You're in the Mercator projection. Okay. So if you want to do. So the GeoTIFF tag would be ignored. That's right. There's no built in support for GeoTIFF. Yes, question? So the question is how do you set opacity? If you're creating a PNG file, PNG has built in transparency in the alpha channel. And so that will be displayed on the map. So it has to create depth on the JPEG. Sorry? It has to create depth on the JPEG. You can't bring in like the canyon shape of that too. Yeah, the, qu the comment or question is the opacity has to be preset in the image. And I believe that's correct. However, I work with this every day. But there are still new things coming all the time that I don't know. So at the end of my presentation, I'll refer you to the official documentation. You can check every single function. Uh, yes, question. Is there a way to make the, uh, the Google uh, streets layer, for example, on top of our tile overlay? Uh, you're asking about putting the map streets on top of 
Your tiles? Okay, so yeah, the question is, if you put a tile layer on top of the map layer, you'll cover up the street names. Is there any way to keep the street name? There are probably a few different options. One I can think of is we have a map type uh, for the hybrid layer, and the hybrid layer is satellite tiles and transparent street names. So you could take the hybrid layer and put it on top of your layer. That's what I would try. Yes? Uh, regarding on the transparency, I wonder if you could use the uh, transition style to just go through the top of the transition. Uh, I use and Mozilla has a drop to to make the image change dynamically with the uh, top of the transition. Yeah, the question is can you use uh, CSS to dynamically change the transparency? I think you'd need uh, a CSS class on your tiles. Uh, it might be possible. I think it's beyond the scope of Q and A right now. In the front. It seems like you could cast the tile through your image magic on some sort of capacitor through that set the transparency on the edge. Yeah, the comment is you could run image magic or something on your server, also because remember you can generate any URL you want, so you can hit your own server, generate any image you want. Let me continue to the next slide. Make sure we cover everything. So I think there was actually just a question about this. This is uh, ground overlay, and it's different from the tile layer overlay. It's actually a little bit simpler. It just takes a single URL for an image and puts it right on the map. So for example, here we have a satellite image of Mount Etna. I think this is Italy. And basically, you give it the URL and also the latitude longitude bounding box. Now, one thing you'll notice that's different from the tile layer, if I zoom in, it's pixelated because it's just a single image. So a tile layer is what you want if you need really good support for multiple zoom layers, multiple zoom levels. All right, this is one of the new features that just launched, traffic. So traffic launched on Google Maps you know, not very long ago, and we already have it for you in the API. And the API we're giving you for traffic is basically a one-line API. If I run this code, you know, you know, here's new traffic layer overlay, and here's add overlay, there you go. And this is exactly what you would see on Google Maps today if you click on the traffic button. So it's a very simple UI. It doesn't provide you any more detail, but it does provide you everything we have on Google Maps. Yes, it's documented. Where does the real-time data come from? Uh, I believe we have a number of providers, and you'd have to check the help on Google Maps for specific information. Yes, I believe it's 2.81, which was just released this week. Question? Can a traffic overlay be inside? Inside Google Earth. I don't believe we currently have support for traffic overlay in Google Earth. Question in the back. You said, is it possible to set a bounding box for overlays? So So I think the question is, can you set a bounding box for your overlays so you're not hitting the server outside of that bounding box? So I think the way you'd want to do that is to make a map type. And in your map type, uh, or you could do it in a tile layer overlay also. You could have a check on the bounding box. And if it's outside of the bounding box, Instead of returning the URL on a server, you just return uh, you know, about blank, or a JavaScript void, or some empty image that would be already cached. All 
All right, this is the other exciting new feature that launched this week, which is driving directions in the API. So this is quite an advanced feature, in my opinion. We have a lot of options. And I also have uh, one of the developers here, if you have any advanced questions that are beyond my knowledge. And I'll show you a couple of examples here. So this is a very basic example. Um, let me ask someone in the audience to take a shot at explaining it. The whole thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly correct. There are a few comments I can add. So here we have a div, which is an element on the page. And we're going to use that div to display the textual instructions. Then we make a directions object. The directions object is your interface. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, So let's see how it runs. So I had it add to this div on the left. These were my bullet points at the top. And it's actually going to add onto the div instead of replace. If you wanted to replace, you could just clear ahead of time. So here is the instructions. It's the same as what you would see on Google Maps if you got directions. Additionally, you can see on the map itself, we have two markers and a polyline. And you even have the full functionality of directions here. So I can click on four, and I get the little pop-up, just as I would on Google Maps. So if you just want to duplicate Google Maps, if you want this you know, one-line traffic kind of interface, here it is. You've replicated Google Maps directions on your site. In the next two slides, we'll see how you can do things to change that interface. Yes, question? Yeah, the question is, can you pass latitude, longitude instead of an address? I would say yes. Anything that works on Google Maps will work in this, too. You, you can also just directly pass in whatever the uh, client geocoder returns. So you can use the geocoder API, do whatever you want with it, and pass that on to the direction system. Thank you. Uh, let me go to some other questions in the back. What routing options do you provide? What routing options do you provide? I'll demonstrate. Uh, a few of the features, and then I'll refer you to our complete documentation here. If you go to the reference, which I have listed as the last page of this presentation, you can look at class G directions, and you can read there are many methods and many options. So here's an example of multipoint directions. So the easy way to do this is you have an array of three addresses. You just pass that to the function load from waypoints, and let's see what you get. So here is a three-step path, and these are the directions. It's in French because right there, I have FR. Let's try DE. Here I am in German. And suppose we wanted to clear the div. It could be something like maybe set it to empty. Sorry. So there, I cleared the div, and then I got the directions in English. Question? Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, Yasin, can yeah, you comment? Currently, it's set to a limit of 10,000 requests per key per day. Uh, we are actively working on seeing if we can increase it as we start getting more data. So the current limit, I'm, I'll just repeat on the microphone. The current limit is 10,000, but we'll see if we can increase it. So you have an error if you exceed the limit. <coughs> yes, question? Is there a structured way to grab that data going across different The question is, is there a way to process the data yourself? And that is slide eight. <laughs> so here's slide eight. Uh, on the left, I have three divs named status, steps, and first. And what I'm doing here is I make a call uh, to G directions. Let me scroll down a little bit. New York to Boston. And a few differences here are when I called the constructor for G directions, I did not give it a handle to the map, and I did not give it a div to display text in. So it's not going to do any of that. In addition, when I made this load call, I passed these two options here get steps true, and get polyline false. So what I really care about is the steps. I want the steps in JavaScript object notation so I can modify it myself. Can you pass street addresses? Yes. Anything you can do on Google Maps for driving directions. You have the same functionality here. So I just ran this, and you'll see I got a status of 200. So that was a success. I got 18 steps, and if I like, I can print the first step right here. So you can see what you're doing here is listening to the load event and then accessing this different information that comes back and displaying it however you want. Question in the back. Uh, do we have any plans to support traveling salesman problem? So for right now, you have exactly the same very strong, very good algorithm that Yatin and all of our driving directions engineers have worked on. Before you move on, is there a, a method to get data into steps? I'm sorry? Uh, I see get step uh, one step at a time. Can mm -hmm. I get like, the whole array? You can't get, uh, there is no method right now to get the whole array. So you can't get all of them. Yeah. So the question is, can you get all of them in an array? No, but you can use a for loop. And again, I'll refer you to the very detailed uh, API reference documentation. All right. So I can answer any questions about the API that I've done so far, and then I'll turn it over to Brandon and Pamela for some of our upcoming features. Question in the middle? Yeah, the uh, Google Maps API shows a lot of uh, JavaScript methods for getting to ROM and so on events and so on. Uh, I usually use other, like for instance, Yahoo UI or Dojo or Prototype uh, for my normal ROM stuff. Uh, is there I'm not sure I understand your whole question, but you're asking about DOM events? Right. With so the, the map API shows this thing where you can attach events to um, the map, for instance, attach function um, event handles to, to uh, map events. Uh, that API is separate and distinct from uh, any other API you might use for reference data. So I would be interested in a consistent API that the map has and uh, using it elsewhere on the site. Not just the map. Is that something that uh, people would consider? For instance, if you do a cross 
Okay, I'll see if I can summarize and answer this uh, quickly because we're a little short on time. Uh, do we have a way outside of the map for handling DOM events in a generic way as an API from Google? So within Google Maps API, we also have DOM event listeners that function separately from the map. You can use those for anything on your page, not just the map. Separately from that, we have other APIs that you can read about in the manual for the conference today, and you can see in the others. But I think getting into a comparison is beyond the scope of right now. So ask us after. And let me turn it over to Brandon. And if you have any more detailed questions, we also have a panel discussion later this afternoon, or you can meet us in the hall. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Doug always does a great job of explaining these uh, concepts. Let's see if you can hear this, but anyone, any Pink Floyd fans? Can you guess from the music what I'm going I'm to talk about today? Um, so I'm going to preview some, some new features that we're going to launch to allow you to make more money uh, with your, your already successful Maps mashup sites. Um, as Doug said, I, I'm, my name's Brandon Badger, and I'm the, the product manager for um, the Maps API. Um, I was going to say, Michael Jones, our CTO, got a demo of that iPhone yesterday, but I tried to get that, but they didn't let me, so I just had to use my iPod here. But, um, so I thought this was a funny image, but you know, maybe this is from like the dot-com era where this guy might have had, you know, says, we'll code HTML for food. You know? So maybe this guy had millions of page views um, on his, map, on his uh, site during the dot-com, but he just couldn't quite transition those eyeballs into, into dollars, right? And, um, and so you know, maybe this was before Google AdSense. And so you know, at Google, we're, you know, we're here to help you create successful you know, web applications for users, but then also you know, helping you build the business model and, and, and how to um, turn that traffic in, in, into revenue so that you can continue with this passion uh, for building these, these great applications. And then in, in contrast to this guy, here's someone that you know, was using AdSense and used it effectively, you can see here. <laughs> so this is, this is what we're hoping for, the, the Maps API plus you know, some monetization here. Yeah, this is a grand overlay over the map. You can scroll around here and stuff, so not too technical. My, my very bad Photoshop skills. So just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, um, so if you've, if you've done searches recently on maps.google.com, um, you, might, you might have noticed some of these, these ads, local business ads that we're embedding into the map. So for example, if you search for hotels, um, San Francisco, and you can try this right now if you want, um, you'll see your regular local business listings, and then you'll also see these, these icons with the custom logo and icon of, of the hotel. And, and these are actually advertisements. Um, and so what we're going we're gonna to do is allow you um, to enable AdSense and enable basically these local business ads on your Maps API site. Here's a key point. So this is all up to you, right? So th um, this is a completely an opt-in program. You know, if uh, basically here's an example of the code snippet where you create a new G AdSense manager object and, and you enable AdSense. So, you know, if, if you feel like you know, this is something you want to pursue with your, your API site and you want to play around with it, you can do that. If you feel like you don't want ads on your Maps API site, that's great too. So, you know, it, it brings to the discussion, you know, how, how, do, how do ads change your site? Because, you know, we, we're not in this just to make money and we also love the technology and playing with it and we really want great websites. So, um, you know, Google has done a lot of work to give relevant ads, you know, because we feel like, you know, a lot of instances, relevant ads can actually make your user experience better. So, whether it be you know high quality hotel ads when someone's searching for, or restaurant ads when someone's searching for hotels or things like that, you know it, it can actually make your, your site better in some instances. And like I said, at, at the end of the day, it's up to you to experiment with these these programs and and see you know what makes sense for your website. Um, and just you know, quick, this is something that you can enable on the free Maps API sites as well as well as if you use an enterprise license. Uh, and just some of the basics of what we're going to be doing here. So um, basically, you just enable AdSense on your map. And our code handles all the work of detecting the, the current viewport. Um, we also look at the content of the, the page around your map. And then we do the work of actually inserting these ads in, into, the, into the map. So you don't have to handle adding or remove these, these ads or anything like that. Um, you know, you'll notice that the ads are inserted with the, the, the advertiser's icon so that they're distinguished from, from the, your, your data on the map. Um, and also, you know, you, you can... You can control, you have a blacklist, basically, of, you know, if you don't want advertisements from certain advertisers on your site, you can control that using your regular AdSense um, account. Here's, here's just that example, just to, to, to clarify. So the actual monetized event in this case is, 
you know, the user clicks on the mark on the map, it pops up the pop-up bubble, and then when that user clicks on one of these links in the pop-up bubble, that's when you would get, um, you know, your share of, of that advertising revenue. You know, so here we go. You know, it's basically, you know, we're, we're, we're really in this together. We're in business together with, with you know, Google and you guys, you know, making, helping you, we're giving you the building blocks to help you build great web applications, and then this is just one more tool. So if you want, if you also need help building the business model around your site, um, we're, we're providing that, and so, you know, we're sharing that revenue between, you know, between the two of us. Uh, here's an example of the code. It's, it's really straightforward. Um, basically, you create a new G Ads Manager. Um, you pass it, you know, the, the handle to your map so that we can insert those ads, um, and you pass in your, your AdSense ID, which, you know, identifies your AdSense account so we know where to, where to send the money, so don't, don't put someone else's AdSense ID in there, right? Um, and then, you know, we'll give you a number of controls, and, and later we'll show you some of the documentation for that. So you can control basically, like, you know, how many ads, maximum limit, how many ads you want on your site and things like that. Um, and then you can basically just go manager.enable, and then you can dynamically enable and disable that as well in your JavaScript. So, you know, one question you might have is, you know, if you're not currently using AdSense, you know, how do I sign up for that ID? Um, Dominic, one of the PMs from AdSense, is here, and he can answer more questions. But basically, it's very simple. You just go to google.com slash AdSense, and, you know, fill out the application, and there's a, um, you get a verification email, and, and there's an approval process there. And, you know, maybe you, you want to advertise your, um, your business on, on Maps API sites. So you can go to our local business center and um, create an account there. You can create a local business ad. Um, you can have that ad shown on maps.google.com. And you can also choose to have that ad shown in our content network so it goes out to Maps API sites. Um, you know, and, and of course, there's, there's also monetization um, features that you can use right now. I mean, right now, there's lots of Maps API sites that are very successful, you know, just having AdSense blocks to the side of their map. Um, I think we'll, we'll be taking this, you know, the next step just by tying those AdSense blocks better to the content in the map um, and also to, you know, the viewport of what the user is looking at. Um, so I think that's where, you know, it'll, it'll be a win for users and that the ads will be more relevant you know, and a win for you because obviously as the ads are more relevant, people are more likely to, to benefit from them and click on them and, and you know, you'll make revenue from that. Um, so that's the gist of it. I mean, we're, we're pretty excited about this. Um, I think, you know, we're shooting for the, the end of June to start launching this program and, you know, we really want, we don't usually preview our, our features, but we really just wanted to start this conversation with you guys because we really are business partners in that, in that sense and, um, you know, we're very open to getting your feedback of how, you know, the types of things that you'd want to see in this program. Uh, so that's all I have today. Um, thank you. We'll, well, I'll do the questions at the end, but if, we're sort of on time, so we'll have Pamela come up. All right, so now for something completely different. Um, my name is Pamela, I'm the Maps API support engineer right now. And I just wanted to talk about the open source library um, that we started in uh, you know, this quarter year um, and the sort of offerings it has right now and what it might have in the future. Um, so why do we have this open source library? Um, JavaScript is pretty easy to extend if you're familiar with the language crazy language and you can just keep on adding stuff to it. Um, so why hide all these useful extensions in code that's really hard to read? If any of you have ever tried to read the JavaScript map ABI, it's not that fun to read. Um, <laughs> in fact, it, it'll probably give you a migraine. Um, so, and we also have a huge amount of feature requests. And if we can fulfill those requests with, you know, user extensions that, you know, we develop outside the core API, then, you know, fantastic. I mean, the point is that everyone wants to have as, you know, as much cool stuff on their map as possible, right? Um, and, you know, we can all work together to make this, this Maps API world a better place. Engineers, developers, whoever wants to join in. And, uh, and the other like, big motivation for me is that there's a lot of user extensions out there right now, and I think it'd be really helpful for everyone if there's one place for all of those, if there's one documentation style for all of those, uh, the same coding conventions for all of them. It makes it a lot easier to use them if they all follow the same, the same format. So those are the motivations for starting this. Um, offerings we have right now in the release directory, there are three uh, libraries, and then I've got one I want to mention that's upcoming, because it's really cool. So we already talked about the marker manager, um, and he, Doug didn't mention that the marker manager is actually the open source version of what's also offered in the API called the G marker manager, but you definitely want to use the open source version, number one, because I fixed a couple bugs in it, 
Um, and number two, I added, I added some functions for deleting clearing markers. Um, but also, it's open source, really easy to extend. There's some people who want to use the marker manager for more advanced clustering, people who want to use it for doing grouping as well as just pan zoom levels. And having all that source code um, with you, you know, Doug already did the hard part of all that zoom pan math. Um, so you just have to add in, you know, whatever you want to tweak it for your uses. Um, and you can even, you don't even have to use it for markers. Um, it actually never checks if it's managing markers. Uh, you know, it just wants to have points to identify by. Um, so there are examples of, uh, you can manage uh, e-labels, e-inserts. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Mike Williams. Um, so he demonstrated being able to manage those with Marker Manager. Um, and I, those are actually, I don't want to kill the browsers. <laughs> um, so you can manage anything you want, maybe. <laughs> you can find out. All right, one more thing. We've got labeled marker. Um, and this comes from a guy named Mike Purvis. He's co-author of the beginning applications with Google Maps. Uh, and he was also a, an intern here this semester. And uh, he worked on the driving directions. So you can also thank him for that. Um, as well as yeah, and, and uh, this is a class that just lets it extends GMarker uh, and lets you stick text labels on top. So let's see if these examples pop up. Um, and this is useful because it means you don't have to go through the effort to go into Photoshop and like pre-create all the icons you want. All right, so here we go. Um, this is my little Silicon Valley map. It was previously called the Pirates of Silicon Valley, but um, they axed that. So, <laughs> but uh, so this is what, this is made it really easy. This is actually all based off a uh, spreadsheet feed. Um, so it made it really simple just to make labels that uh, you know that had stock tickers on them. And this is all from Google Finance uh, and Google in Google spreadsheets. Um, so that's fun stuff right there. And so you can see that this will make it easier for you to create dynamic markers. All right, and then we've got the drag zoom control. I just added this about 3 a.m. this morning. It's very recent, fresh off the presses. Um, this is from Andre Lewis. Are you in the audience anywhere right now, Andre? All right, he's back there, cool. All right, um, he's also the co-author of the same book um, that I just mentioned, right? Um, and this was previously called G-Zoom, um, and Andre had it out for a while. Um, we did some cleaning up, um, and we did a lot of uh, documentation. Um, and examples. And basically, this is a feature crust people have been asking for. Users can click on this control and they can drag on a rectangle on the map to define where they want to zoom. And I know you're always, you're sitting there on the map and you're like, gosh, I just want to zoom in on that little area right there. So this is an easy way to let your, your users do that. Um, so let me show you the, one of the examples. All right, so I click here. We've got our little G-Log here. If any of you are not using G-Log, please use it. Don't use alerts. You don't want to use alerts anymore once you use G-Log. G-Log is this console that they introduced in version two of the API um, that's really nice and it doesn't, doesn't interrupt and you don't have to press OK all the time um, when you're debugging anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you can copy and paste. Yeah, G-Log is amazing. I, I just put the API on every page I'm using now, even if I don't make a map, because I just want to use G-Log. Um, but OK, so here we go. I'll drag in. Um, and you can see, you can attach listeners, event listeners, to when you're dragging and when you've stopped dragging. And uh, we've just decided to output that information there. Um, so here you go, zooming, zooming way in there. Um, and then I did make also a little thingy. If you want to play, there's a huge amount of options. Um, so I did make a little interactive app here where you can play with the options. And, uh, you know, you can do, let's see, we can stick sticky, sticky zoom on. So when we have sticky zoom on, we can just keep on zooming. We don't have to click, keep pressing the control. That's personally the way I like it, uh, but it's up to you. And then at the bottom here, it'll give you the code. So instead of having to screw with all the options in there, you can just check it out there. So hopefully some of you guys will uh, go back and uh, put a drag zoom control on your map, let people drag. And then here's an upcoming offering. It's uh, technically called a presentation graphics library. This is for all you people who want to put graphs on the map. Um, and maybe you thought about doing it with you know, SVG, VML, G-Polygon. Um, and this one is using G-Polygons and G-Polylines. Um, this is from Isa. Uh, and if you're in the groups, I'm sure you've seen him a lot. And here's a little preview. 
so here's a pie chart on the, on the thing here. Um, and you can see the data that he used to define it. And he's got a couple more things here. He's also got a bar graph. And so you can see this nice bar graph here. So those of you who are showing information that could be represented in graphs, you may be interested in that. And so we should be releasing that this summer. Um, so that's what we have right now. It's a pretty new project. If any of you guys have your own extensions or if you want to help us uh, just code review the things that are in there right now, edit code, create documentation, just want to get involved at all, um, or uh, just, just go, I've got a URL way at the bottom there that's really little, or just Google for GMAPS utility library. Um, and there's uh, some information there on joining. Basically, all you do is you have to sign this form, and don't worry about it. It's, uh, it's a very nice form. And then <laughs> we're not stealing your soul, just your code. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no, you can, you can read it. But, uh, and then just send me an email, and I'll add you to the project, and we can uh, start working together. And you can ask Andre. I'll give you a lot of help with your code. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll create lots of fun examples because I enjoy doing that. Um, or you can also just join the Google group we have where we discuss some of the things that are going on, um, possible future extensions. So get involved. All right. OK. All right, so any questions about everything we just said? Pamela's been a great addition, yeah. <laughs> Pamela just graduated from USC just a couple weeks ago. How did your finals go? Well enough. You got your grades yet? That's good. <laughs> she knew she had a job before she took a finals. I know. So. I mean, it's hard to study when you can do mashups instead. Yeah, but she, she, you know, she helps a lot in our forum, so if you've spent some time there, you know, the, you, you guys do a lot of the work of answering the questions, yeah, you but, do. you know, we try to help where we can. And, um, if there's spam yeah. and it's still there, you can email me and I'll remove it. Um, hmm? Sleep. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh-huh. Any any maps questions? All right. Yeah, no, on Google Maps right now it seems like there's a limit and the like a limit of size and number of elements in the HTML uh, maps. Any idea of when data will be documented that will possibly increase by pixels? Um so we are now we're definitely parsing the entire files, um, but there's still the rendering restriction and I think what will basically happen is when we give you more access to the KML or the DRSS that we parse in the GDRXML, um, giving you more access will let you control the amount that's shown on the map. Um, but we still are trying to prevent people from accidentally loading a million markers on the map. So um, I think that's going to come through when we add additional access methods to GDRXML. Yep, in the back. Yay. <laughs> um, as far as ad time, is there any plans for tying in, like, the user of the map directly into ad time? Could be contextual ads that ads will be used for as a map, the ads will change? I, I think, in fact, we, we would like to sort of tie what's happening in the map, be it either the viewport or potentially some searches and things like that, to control what the ads blocks to the side. Because I do agree, I think that will end up with more relevant ads, because you're basing on what the user is actually doing in the map. So I think, I think it's, I think we'll be working on that, yeah. So one, one, one of my maps, I have an average of maybe like 10 minutes for each user. So I'm imagining the whole time we're seeing. The same ad, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ads, so, I mean, each map will change as they change the user. I agree. I think that'll be much more useful for the users and, and more easy to monetize, too. Right, yep, sorry. So for ranking search results, so the KM, we did launch this KML search project, and this is important for Maps API direct um, developers because KML search will continue to be a more important way for you to get traffic to your site. So you know, as he mentioned, you can define all your geospatial data in KML, and the KML search team can, will index that as the Google crawler finds the KML files. And then when users search on Google Earth in the search box and on Maps, um, you know, we'll find those KML files, and of course you can have links in your pop-up bubbles and whatnot back to your site. It's, they have their own algorithm where they're, they're working to try to you know, pick the most relevant search results and try to figure out which are spammy and which are, are better. And I don't think they've, they've fully publicized that algorithm. I think they're working on, on getting more relevant results. If you guys are interested in KML search or just generally uh, you know, putting your information in the sitemap and making it searchable, there is a session at 4.30 today um, in 
the room next door, so you should definitely check that out. Um, the KML Search Product Manager. Yeah, so you should definitely ask that question there, too. I'm sorry, right here in the blue? Is this available? I believe that all of the presentations will be available online. Um, I think that it's part of the, um, just the Google Developer Day, they're, they're doing that, yeah. Yeah, check like in a day. Sorry, in the black shirt? No, that, that's a good point. So, you know, one of the difficulties when we talk about, you know, indexing the content of a map is that with the JavaScript API, you know, you're dynamically adding markers and re removing them in the JavaScript, and it's very hard to, for us to sort of crawl and index that type of data. So, you know, related to this is this whole notion of using, defining your data in KML and then adding that to the map. It's much easier for us to then index all of that data from the KML file. So, I think we will be working going forward to, you know, if, as you're using KML more in these Maps API sites to then, you know, look at, the content that what you have in the pop-up bubbles and the info windows, and then serving the ads based upon the content in the map. I, I think probably our version one will just still be using a lot of the data, you know, a lot of the data from the HTML page around the map. But certainly, it's better to use what's in the map itself. Sorry, right in the pink shirt. Um, as far as the importing uh, shapefiles, I, I don't know. Okay, so if you look on the Google group, we have uh, several resources on that. Um, there's, there's a shape to KML um, converter that someone's written. Uh, I've got a shape to XML on my laptop. Um, so you don't, there's no direct import of shapefiles. Um, they are, uh, they're, not, they're not an XML format. So you want to translate those into KML or an XML format and then parse it itself. But we definitely, there are a lot of resources because a huge amount of people obviously use shapefiles. Um, so if you can't find those, just let us know. I'll, I'll point you out to where they are. In the black shirt. So I think the first question was, can, can you, is it with that, in that open source project, you know, there's that component that someone has written for the, the chart. So the question is, can you, can you drive the, the data for the charts from the, what's on the map? Or? Show the chart on the map. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah. yeah in her example. Right, I had that stock map, that, and that actually showed the uh, POE, which stands for something finance Some related. Thing, yeah. Uh, you can tell I learned a lot about finance doing this. Um, but that showed the POE as, a, as a, just a bar chart. Um, and there's been some threads about doing that. And the, the library I showed you was could do like pie charts and bar graphs. So if you are interested in just showing that on the map, the other option you have is to, in an info window, show graphs. Um, and there's a couple JavaScript libraries you can use to do that, um, PlotKit and uh, WebFX chart. Or you could also use the PHP Parkline, uh, Sparklines library which will generate images for you, um, which work nicely. And, and just related to the open source project, I mean, and, and Doug's talk this morning in the intro to Maps API, one of the questions is, was, you know, you have the G marker, are you gonna have more overlays? Like, are you gonna have triangle markers or just text? I mean, you can think of an infinite number of types of markers, and really with the open source project, it's a way for or to us to organize your work, and we can work together to sort of have more options, but whereas it doesn't make sense for us to bake all of those things into the core Maps API, because we wanna make that, you know, quick loading and and just have the core features. You can basically put anything on a map. It just depends how much effort you want to go into it. Um, but it's all pretty doable. In the black shirt. How much is this going to make its way to enterprise users, kind of level? Um, so which stuff to make it to the enterprise users? I'm sorry. Uh, the maps API that's going to be mapped. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Like, about, like, like the Google app? Earth? Yeah, we have a Google Earth enterprise user box. Oh. Um, I mean, so I mean, we, we gen generally work fairly closely with the Google Earth team, but I'm not as familiar with the, the Fusion project and stuff to, to know where, where all those integrations will be. Sorry. Sorry, in the black. Right now it isn't. Um, I think the talk is to open up an HTTP. Yeah, we will be releasing an HTTP, uh, either an XML or a JSON interface in the upcoming month. So within the next month or two, hopefully we'll have it done. Sorry, in purple?
I'm sorry, so the question is, you have a map with the daytime, Im daytime imagery and the nighttime imagery? Uh-huh. So you want that, or you have that already? Right. Um, so I was actually working on that with my mom a week ago, because she's an astronomer. Um, so there's, you need to Google the, what is it, if anyone can correct me, like the Earth time equation. Um, but there is, there's a really nice map out there that's actually done in Flash and doesn't use Google Maps, but it has, has that overlay on there. Um, but it, is, it, it sort of ends up looking like this curve. So you have to. Um, I, I would bet that there's Google Earth layers that do that. So you might do a search for KML well, yeah. files that do that. And then you could just overlay that map. But it changes. But uh, if you talk to me after, because I, I did a lot of uh, research into that. And I'm, I'm almost got a maplet that sort of does that. So. Yep. What was it? The, to make, uh, to make, uh, are there efforts to make more objects clickable and draggable? I mean, maybe Doug, oh, do you have any yes. input on? Yeah. Because yeah. um, I, I, obviously people want. Um, the clickable polygons, and that is a feature request, and I think it's being worked on. Yeah, yep. We have draggable objects for anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's G-draggable objects to, to, to make things draggable. That's um, actually a good point that Pamela made, that that's a feature request. So on their support group, Pamela put together a wiki page where you can actually put your feature requests. So it's a very interactive development process where, you know, you can say, hey, I want polygons clickable, and, you know, we look at that right. and... You know, work on so the things. more people that sign their names to that, the, the more I bug the engineers to, uh, to code that. So with, um, you might have a, it's in the nose layer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Are there any specific features, accessibility features in Gmaps or like screen readers, things like that? Do you know? No, we, we get that question There's sometimes. I think that's something that we should w w potentially work on. Yeah, we've gotten that question, and I don't remember if we've had a good answer. If anyone here remembers, they're welcome to pipe up. The question was um, like accessibility features, so for like screen readers and whatnot, for use in the like, Google Maps. Um, so. No, this is for this is for blind, right? Is that what? You, yeah, this is so for blind users who are accessing Google Maps, um, some alternative interface for them to access that. Um, and I don't think there's anything obvious. But if you have input, for example, of how that should be done, like what it should look like, we'd be open to hearing that too. Okay, so I think we have one more question. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. On the AdSense question, um, so like right now, there won't be control over what the, um, you know, the styling of the pop-up bubble with the ad, but that's something we'll look into. As far as um, easier to make custom um, info windows. Um, that's something that would be in the library. I was about to add, I wrote something sort of like an info window, and I was going to add that to the library soon, um, and you could look into that. There's not, unless Google Maps really wants to have a lot of custom info windows, there's not a huge reason to put it in the API. Because when you think about the API, you only want the things in the API that are core. So the things you want in there are definitely things that interact with like the Google servers that couldn't be outside of that. So that's like the priority. Anything that's sort of extending like and making, taking something that already exists and is possible to do outside of the API, I think we should consider whether it belongs in core or if we could you know, extend it outside. So putting it's, it in that open source project, yeah, yeah. It's always better to not have obfuscated code is my personal belief. Yeah, because then you can have the, yeah, exactly. All right, well, thanks, everyone.